Ago, Mambo, greetings. Welcome. The All African People's Revolutionary Party is here. And we sincerely welcome each and every one of you who are joining us today. We hope that you have the sunshine that we're experiencing. And we will definitely bathe in that sunshine and pass it along through our fire for freedom and justice for the masses of humanity. We hope you are able to maintain your highest level of physical, mental, and spiritual health today and every day. And we thank you for joining us for this critical topic, gestational diabetes and women in capitalism. We don't care if it's March, April, July, September, we are gonna continue at all times our focus on destroying patriarchy, destroying systems of oppression, destroying the oppression and subjugation of all women and women identifying people. So we don't care that March is over. We're still talking about the issues impacting women and women identifying people, and we will continue to do so. So we thank you for joining us while Shakura and I engage this topic today. And we start as we always do, um, good family, good friends, enemies out there listening. We will acknowledge the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere. This is their land. They're fighting for their land back. They're not fighting for casinos. They're not fighting for you to acknowledge that they exist. They are fighting for what was stolen from them, their land. And if you live anywhere in the Western Hemisphere, then you are living, walking, existing on their land. It is not yours. Stop going to these ridiculous protests talking about whose streets, our streets. They don't belong to you. They belong to the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere. And when we say indigenous, we're talking about the American Indian people. We're talking about the native people to this hemisphere. We're not talking about you confused Africans out there who have not read a single book on African history and have accepted the lies told to you by the capitalist system. So out of your shame for who you are, you want to invent and make up lies about who you are, talking about you've been here, and you all are getting all, you're paying these capitalist corporations hundreds of dollars to get these DNA tests, and not one of you can produce one test that verifies that you and your family have been in this hemisphere thousands of years. All of you getting these tests talking about you from the Congo, but Congo region, that you're from Ghana, that you're from, as they, as they, these capitalists put it, sub-Saharan Africa, and yet still these lies persist. So we honor the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere, and we honor our ancestors, you all, who fought for our liberation. Now, this past week, it's just interesting because you had the death of DMX, the rapper, and then you also had, a few days before that, the death of Romaine Chip Fitzgerald. And we understand most of you have no idea who Romaine Chip Fitzgerald is. And so we want to tell you that he was one of, if not the longest held political prisoner in this backward capitalist system. He was in prison for 52 years as a member of the Black Panther Party. And while many of us talk about what we do to the police, he was in prison that long because he had a shootout with the police. He joined the LA Black Panther Party branch and had a shootout and a California Highway Patrol person was killed in that shootout and he went to prison as a result of that. So he didn't just talk about it. He actually did 52 years and he made his physical transition. And I just mentioned that because it's not, you know, all death is bad. We want to always acknowledge everybody's life and their death. But the fact that the internet is ablaze about DMX dying, and this is someone who I, I understand, I grew up with his music just like you did. So I understand people have sentimental attachment to these artists. But the reality is that, you know, this is someone who made a career and the only reason why you know him is because he rapped about denigrating African women. I mean, that's, on, that's irrefutable. And at the same time, we know nothing about someone like Chip Fitzgerald, who spent their entire life incarcerated standing up for us and fighting for our freedom and justice for us as a people. So that's just really interesting because all of us want to believe that we think for ourselves. We always want to believe that, you know, nobody's telling us what to think, but yet how we prioritize what we uh, uh, mention and what we're focused on is based on the information provided to us by our enemies, this system. 
So they highlight African celebrities and people like that. So that's who we pay attention to. Whether we want to admit it or not, the truth is obvious because if it wasn't true, you would know who Chip Fitzgerald was. You would know that person as well, if not better than you knew DMX. And the only reason why I know who Chip Fitzgerald is is because I made it a point to find out and prioritize learning about people. I don't, I don't have any more intelligence than you do or any more time or any more resources than you do. I just made that a priority. So this is a clear sign of the contradiction that we face you all. As long as we know so much more about the DMXs of the world and so little about the Chip Fitzgeralds, this explains why we're in the position we're in today as a society, as a world. So we would be remiss if we didn't address that. So you know, hopefully you don't, doesn't make you feel bad. And if it does, then you need to look in the mirror and, and, and think about how we can do better collectively, because we should be honoring Chip Fitzgerald. If, if we honored Chip Fitzgerald with a fraction of the energy that we spent the last few days honoring DMX, we would be free. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. We thank you all for coming and joining us today. We're honored to talk about this subject and every subject that we talk about every week here. Um, we've been doing this broadcast for over a year. Um, people are watching, hundreds, thousands of people, and we will continue to grow, and we appreciate you all doing that. And we'll just start with our introductions. Um, my name is Ajamu. Um, so if you want to know who to hate, you know who it is. <laughs> or longtime organizer in the All African People's Revolutionary Party on three continents and the Caribbean, and we'll continue to do this work for as long as I have breath in my body. And with me is my outstanding and amazing daughter, Shakura, who grew up in the All African People's Revolutionary Party's Young Pioneer Institute. So she's been engaged in APRP her entire life. Um, she is now studying for a, her doctorate, she'll be the first one in our family to reach that objective. And in women's health, particular to African women's health, indigenous women's health, and, and figuring out ways to address those contradictions. So extremely proud of her, her work in the party, as well as you know the work that she does everywhere she exists. And I'm just glad to be able to share this space with her and just glad to be able to share her life with her um, because I've known her for as long as she's been alive, obviously. So thankful for that. And again, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, our objective, you all, is Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism, which we define as one unified socialist Africa. One unified socialist Africa. As Kwame Nkrumah, who wrote the book you see on the right, The Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare, which is our guiding light in building Pan-Africanism, as he said, until Africa is free, Africa must be the core of the Black Revolution worldwide. Until Africa is free, no African or no Black person anywhere on earth will be free. And we believe that wholeheartedly. So the logos you see under Nkrumah's Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare are political parties and formations throughout Africa that we have spent the last 50 years since the handbook was written forging strong relationships with so that we can continue to do the work to liberate Africa and achieve Pan-Africanism. So the Pan-Africanist Congress, PAC, of Azania is one of those groups. Azania is what you call by the colonial name South Africa. Um, the PAIGC, the African Party for the Independence of Guinea-Bissau and Guinea-Bissau, the Democratic Party of Guinea and Guinea, two different countries, uh, the Azanian People's Organization, just explain that, the Milkar Cabral Ideological School in Nigeria, the Zimbabwe Movement for Pan-African Socialists. I'll be going down there at the end of this summer to do building work with them in Zimbabwe. Uh, the Pan-African Union of Sierra Leone and many, many, many others who accept Nkrumah's definition and the definition that came out of the fifth Pan-African Congress in 1945 of Pan-Africanism being one unified socialist Africa. And we have chapters all over the world and relationships with other liberation movements. We wholeheartedly and uncompromisingly support the liberation of Palestine for the Palestinian people, the liberation of Ireland for the Irish people, and absolutely the liberation of the Western Hemisphere for the real, not you all fake people out here, but the real indigenous people 
of the Western Hemisphere, the American Indian people, the native people of this hemisphere. We support all those relationships and build and maintain relationships with those uh, communities and organizations in an effort to make us stronger. So with that, I will turn it over to Shakura, who's gonna rock us on this critical topic of how gestational diabetes is devastating women all over the world. Oh, first, I'm sorry, I misspoke. I, I have, Shakura asked me to do a brief uh, introduction to the concept of diabetes. So uh, I was so interested in hearing Shakura speak that I forgot about that, but uh, I'll go ahead and do that. Um, and then she'll go into the gestational aspect of diabetes. So not sure, you know, a lot of people know this, but some don't, so it's important to go over it. So you should know that every food item that you consume that isn't meat, which is protein, or isn't a leafy green vegetable, that food item turns into sugar once it gets into your bloodstream. Doesn't matter what it is, you all. It could be rice, it could be an apple, it could be a banana, it could be a candy bar. All of it turns to sugar. The only question is, how fast it turns to sugar. If it's what's called a complex carb, which is like an apple, then it takes longer. And that's good because then it doesn't just flood your stream with your bloodstream with sugar. If it's a candy bar processed food, it immediately turns to sugar. And this is a problem for people who are diabetic because ideally the pancreas releases insulin, which is a chemical your body produces into the bloodstream. And what the insulin does is it burns off this sugar that I just mentioned in your bloodstream. So if you have sugar just flooding your bloodstream, the insulin has to work a little harder. And the problem for people who are diabetic is that if you're a type one diabetic, your body doesn't, your pancreas is not producing any insulin. And if you're a type two diabetic, like I am, your body is not producing enough insulin. And so this is a problem. And so the, the way you address it, the thing about diabetes is that um, for this type, type one and type two, it's a manageable disease for most people. I certainly manage mine. And the way I do it is I control what I eat and I exercise and I do things because it's a, it's a credit debit system, you all. It's how many carbohydrates, that's the food that turns to sugar, your body is consuming and how much of that you're burning off. If you're burning off more than your body consumes, like I do, then you don't have a problem. If you're not, then the sugar accumulates in your bloodstream. And that's why diabetics suffer from having blood clots and having appendages um, amputated and have issues with their kidneys and all these things that ultimately end up uh, resulting in serious illness and oftentimes, unfortunately, death. OK, so socioeconomics, we have to, of course, if you tuned in here, you know, we're going to bring it there, take it there. Socioeconomics are always going to play a role in everything that happens in our lives. And so people in poor communities, colonized people, oppressed people don't have the economic capacity to spend money on more complex carbs because complex carbs are more expensive. It's much more expensive to buy uh, quality fruits and vegetables in the long run and quality foods than it is to buy Twinkies um, and potato chips. So this is why diabetes is an epidemic. And even in Africa over the last 10, 15 years, we've seen diabetes become an epidemic because people throughout Africa don't have the financial capacity to buy quality food, traditional African food that's cooked in Africa. They don't have the ability to eat that consistently. So since McDonald's and KFC is prominent in Africa now, that's what people tend to eat because it's cheaper, just like people here do the same thing. So this has created a situation where diabetes is an epidemic for African people all over the world. It's an epidemic for the indigenous people of the Western hemisphere. And again, when we say indigenous, we're talking about American Indian people, Chicano people, Mexicano, Puerto Ricano, all of those people are indigenous to this hemisphere. If you're not any of those groups, then you're not indigenous to the Western hemisphere. Just deal with that. Study some books, learn your true history, especially if you're African, do that. Do us all a favor, wipe out ignorance and do that. But um, this is what we're talking about. So high fiber foods are more expensive. 
And so poor people can't buy them. And that's why um, diabetes is such a, a, a factor in our community. And that's why it's an epidemic for poor populations. And so with that, now I will turn it over to Shakur. Okay, thank you so much, Daddy. I really appreciate that. I think it's so important that we dive into understanding what is diabetes. And of course, understanding the economic connections that are tied to that. So I thank you so much for walking us down that path. I'm actually gonna keep us going in that direction because we need to understand that with everything that happens in this world, it can always be traced back to capitalism. So let's just continue to understand that that is the basis for why majority of people, especially poor people are unhealthy and are unable to have access to a healthy lifestyle. And so on that note, we wanna to continue to think about how capitalism and limited economic resources in predominantly communities of color or even predominantly poor communities, what that can look like in terms of their increase to have debilitating gestational diabetes or even having diabetes develop later on postpartum after the woman identifying person has given birth to their child. So Bazar Jan Hejazi, et al. 2021 published a study in the Journal of Racial and Ethnic Disparities and Chronic Health Conditions Among Women with the History of Gestational Diabetes. And what they found was African women with GDM were disproportionately affected and had a higher risk to be diagnosed with chronic conditions. They also found a correlation that tied into that that argued that smoking and obesity were strongly associated with chronic disease diagnoses. Now, I want us to just focus on that for just a second, because I understand that smoking is a very popular behavior that a lot of people of color adopt for various reasons. And I think, again, tying it back to capitalism, we also need to think about the stress that people of color are under. We need to think about the limited resources and their inability to have a quality life because they're working three or four jobs, or maybe they cannot continue to manage paying their bills because of X, Y, and Z. Maybe they're having issues with transportation. So getting to their places of business and work is very challenging for them. And so we have all these different factors that get in the way of people's ability to just try to live um, what they would call a normal life, right? And so that makes it very hard for them. So maybe adopting some type of behavior like smoking helps to kind of help them relax a little bit. So I don't want us to be critical and say, oh, so smoking women are more likely to develop diabetes. No, I want us to think globally and I want us to think critically and to ask ourselves, why are African women and women identifying in positions where they need to adopt this behavior because they are so triply oppressed? That's really, really, really what I want us to focus on. We need to think about their gender, okay? We need to think about their class and we need to think about their race and how all those things play into their inability to give birth the way that they want, to give birth in a way that is positive for them and to give birth in a way that is at least as traumatic as possible. And if they are able to accomplish those three things, can they still develop and give birth to the baby and then still not develop diabetes along the way as postpartum, as I mentioned before? Because there have been some cases where you can develop gestational diabetes while you are expecting your child. And then you can also develop uh, a former uh, either type one or type two at a later point, way long after the baby has already been born. So we still need to think about the implications. We still need to think about the environment, the survival instincts, whatever is causing our African sisters and our African sister women identifying to be in these positions where they're unable to control how they are developing diabetes. And I really want us to think about that. So it's interesting that the finding from the article pulled out that smoking and obesity were associated with that because my argument to the authors would be, did you all go into more detail about understanding why those things are connected to this specific population? Because I hate it when doctors say, you know, African women need to exercise more or African women just need to stop eating donuts. Like it's, it's so much more complicated than that. And to make those assumptions and to make those, uh, how do I say, just lack of understanding, like just very blank um, racist statements to me is very problematic as a, pro as a provider because you need to understand that there's so much more to it. And, and if you even knew what a social determinant of health was, if you even knew that she's working three jobs to keep her lights on and to keep food on the table for her son, you, you have no idea. You have no idea what she's going through right now or, or what they are going through. So I just really want us to kind of think about that and use our large global lens to just kind of look into that. 
I also want to say that women identifying with gestational diabetes are seven times more likely, this is what I was talking about, to develop type 2 diabetes later on and may require more lifelong diabetes screenings. Okay, so seven times more likely, okay? And then chronic conditions have a multifactorial cause. So you could have diabetes and hypertension. We know that that's when your blood pressure is not pumping the way it's supposed to, or you might also be more prevalent. African women who have GDM are more prevalent along with indigenous sisters and women identifying, native women identifying. They're more likely than European women to develop diabetes along the life course, okay? So this is something that kind of stays with them. And again, I, I like that we're focusing on when they are expecting, but we have to understand even once the baby is born, they still are not completely out of the woods because they still could develop diabetes at a later point in their life. Next slide, please. Okay, so I mentioned a couple of terms and I wanna go into more detail with them. So in the previous slide, I mentioned social determinants of health. I'm not sure if you all are familiar with that, but I'm just gonna kind of walk us through what that is just so we can have an idea. And I just wanna start off by saying that, you know, we understand that this system bases a majority of how they understand what, how they define obesity is a very racist and white supremacist standpoint. Um, how they define body mass index, very racist and white supremacist. Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because these measurement tools that they use, so BMI, for example, is not based on something that takes into account that different people from different backgrounds are going to be built differently, okay? The body mass index is based strictly on European bodies that are based out of Europe. And so if you were born in Asia or if you were born in Africa, if you were born somewhere else, then you would never, ever, ever be able to fit into that frame because you, you literally have a different bone density. You have a different calcium amount in your bones. There's so much difference that is going on that there's no way that you would be able to fit into that. So I think it's toxic and I think it's extremely detrimental to continue to use one framework system that measures everyone when we know that that one system is not adequate to measure everyone. So I just wanna be very clear and telling you that even though I put the BMI on this slide, please understand I am not in support of the BMI index. Not no way, no shape, no form, no how. And I have raised this struggle in my classes with my instructors and in arguing to them that it's very uh, racist and white supremacist for us to use this model, especially because I am a researcher and I do consider myself a healthcare provider to some extent because I have a dual background and I'm also studying to become a lactation consultant. So it's very dangerous to use this because I'm continuing to fill other minds of toxicity and making them understand that they are not enough if they don't meet this criteria of what the BMI is. And I really think it's important for us to continue to go back to our roots. So what did we do before the BMI was created? Which by the way, it was created by a European person. So I rest my case in terms of the white supremacy standard. So with that, we have to understand that BMI, according to people who have no idea how real people live their lives, is they, they're arguing that BMI is what drives the insulin based on racist practices, okay? So I want us to keep in mind that there is some knowledge and understanding that we need to make sure that our insulin is functioning properly, but we can't continue to rely on systems that are not meant for us and systems that are not meant on understanding how our backgrounds as well as our uh, 2021 ideologies and behaviors are functioning. So what do I mean by that? So I mean that, you know, we have our own ideas based on what we were doing in Africa. And then we were kidnapped and we were dispersed throughout the entire world. And we still continue to keep some of those ideas. And then colonialization continued to wipe it out one by one by one, to the point where we literally didn't remember who we were or what we were doing before. So then we had to try to adopt new things and assimilate and just figure out how to exist in this world. And that became really challenging for us because we still had to continue to grapple, literally grapple. So I mean, like literally pulling together food scraps. And that's where this concept of soul food came from. So literally grappling to pull together stuff to just try to make up an identity because we literally were beaten and didn't know who we were anymore. So I understand that that's why some of us continue to eat fried fish. Like I understand that fish fry, it, right? Like I'm very clear and I understand that's where that comes from because historically or historically or their historically throughout time, we understand that that's what was given to us. And we literally had to make do with what we had available. I, I understand that. And I thank my ancestors for that. But I think that over a period of time, we weren't really able to understand, okay, maybe there's a way that we could still have this fried taste, but maybe bacon, 
Or maybe there's a way that we could try air frying it so that we don't use as much oil. Or maybe we use a certain type of oil. So I think those modifications in terms of how we cook and what food means and how we fellowship with food, I think those are things that we kind of haven't really uh, been able to sharpen those skills as much. And I think it's really important that we do that, especially when we think about how women identifying they have different hormones when they're expecting, they have different taste buds. There are some things that they could eat a lot of, and there's some things that they cannot eat too much of at all. And then if it's more than one child for them, maybe they were able to eat ginger with their first pregnancy, but their second pregnancy, ginger makes them want to throw up. So just understanding all these different things and how hormones have a really hard way of allowing them to just enjoy food when they're expecting, just all these things we need to kind of think about and consider. And so on that note, I also want to highlight, this is also a systemic problem and based on capitalism. This is another explanation for why GDM develops is that you have loss of healthcare coverage, loss of healthcare coverage right after the pregnancy. So as soon as, soon as she is able, as soon as they are able to deliver the baby, their ability to be seen by a provider goes away. And of course we understand in socialist countries like Cuba, for example, that's not even a thing that is heard of because we understand from a socialist standpoint that Women identifying moms need to be cared for before, during, and after they give birth, right? Their health doesn't deteriorate once the baby comes into the world. So just being clear about that, because that could obviously be a wrench and throw um, an issue in the plans of them continuing to manage their health postpartum, which you have things like postpartum depression. So this is why it's still important for them to have access to care even after the baby is born. But them being able to have access to that and then being able to still ask those questions and being able to feel like their values are met. Of course, we wanna make sure that the baby is healthy and well, but as I said, maternal mortality, postpartum depression, these things are very much alive and well postpartum. So after the baby has been delivered, these things are still most likely to happen. So just being mindful of those things, especially as it helps us develop, what is this health inequity and how do we still deal with that? And then of course, we wanna keep in mind, as I talked about social determinants of health, Basically, those are society, those are barriers in society that have been placed to determine our health, okay? So, for example, in my master's program, I learned that social determinants of health are components that explain and drive our ability to achieve optimal health. So, what are some examples of social determinants of health? Your race is a social determinant of your health. Your gender is a social determinant of your health. And finally, your class. What is your income level? What do you have access to? Do you have private? Do you have public? Do you have no insurance? What are those things? How much money are you making? Because of course, the more money you make, the more likely you are to be healthy and to reach optimal health. Next slide, please. Okay, so as we continue to think about what GDM is, and then what are some causes of GDM, I want us to continue to understand, I actually wanted to create a completely separate slide because patriarchy, I didn't think needed to be joined in with the other causes. I think this needs to be its own slide because we need to understand and keep in mind, as my dad has pointed out so eloquently before, patriarchy was around in Africa way before slavery even started. So I'm talking about before Africans had African slaves and way before Europeans went to Africa and started colonizing and kidnapping us, okay? So this is definitely something that we need to think about. And there have been theories that have been developed based on patriarchy, based on sexism, based on toxic masculinity. So we wanna continue to think about how patriarchy and the umbrella terms that I just described, how they impact a person's ability to have GDM and their ability to fight GDM and to make it so that their system is able to function so that they are not considered as being diabetic by the time they give birth to the child, but also, of course, later, they're not developing a type 2 uh, secondary source of gestational diabetes or just type 2 diabetes at that point. So in case you're unfamiliar, I just want to highlight two really quick theories. So muted group theory is a critical theory concerning certain groups of people who remain powerless compared to others. This was introduced by Edwin Ardener, and basically what they developed was they had contributions that were pulling from anthropology and communication studies. And what they found was that when they had studies on gender, they found that for many of the studies on gender, many of the concepts were pulled together from a generalized male population standpoint. So, you know, when you look at an article and it says, you know, our findings indicate that this many people said X, Y, and Z they were finding from this muted group theory delivery that 
are they really looking at, you know, an equal number of non-binary people and women identifying and men identifying, or are they just looking at men identifying and then saying that that covers everyone else under the portal because men identifying people said that that's what it was from the findings of the article. So they also come, went on to find out that basically the voices of women identifying people and were often unheard and ignored or muted to some extent, okay? So the narrow perspective of the society ignoring almost half of the population affected the studies and the muted group theory brought light into the powers of a marginalized society. Along those same notes, one of my favorite theories that I use in every single one of my papers is standpoint theory. This was created by some African scholars uh, not too long ago. And what they found out was that based on your positionality in the world, you are more likely to see things from a very clear lens if you are an oppressed member of society. So if you want to picture with me a ladder, for example, if you are an oppressed person, then you are most likely at the bottom of that ladder, but that actually gives you a very large vantage point because you're able to look up and see everything you need to see. So you see the inadequacies with the system. You see how African men are profiled by the police and police brutality is an existing thing, African women identifying too. You see that indigenous people still don't have their land back and they're still fighting for it. And people continue to uh, disrespect and dis, uh, dis, uh, dishumanize and just completely not acknowledge that the indigenous people have given us this beautiful gift and that we continue to disrespect not only them, but their land. When you're oppressed, you're able to see so much because you are unfortunately at the bottom and you're not valued. So you have no choice but to have a higher ideology on what's going on because you understand that you've been living it your whole life, unfortunately. And if you start to be oppressed in more than one space, so maybe you're oppressed because of your gender, but you're also differently able. Maybe you're oppressed because of your race, but you're also uh, identifying with LGBTQ. Maybe you're oppressed because you're a person of color, but you also identify as a woman. So there's all these different intersections, if you will, on how you can be oppressed in, on top of the fact that you're already oppressed. So when you're at the bottom of the ladder, you see everything and you understand why the system operates the way it does. You're very clear. You're not confused because that's what happens to you because you've been going through this your whole life. If you are at the top of the ladder, then that means you have more access to money. You have more access to income. You're not understanding how the system truly, truly works because all you see is your eye's vantage point. So literally straight ahead, what your eye can see. It never, ever, ever occurs to you to look down and to actually consider that there are people under you because to do that would mean that you would have to acknowledge your privilege. You would have to acknowledge your class. You would have to acknowledge that you are in a higher privilege point than someone else. And that means that you were different from them because of your accessibilities that you have access to. So standpoint theory is an amazing theory because it helps oppressed people understand not only do you have the power to understand what's happening, but if you all continue to organize, if you all continue to stand up, you can overturn that ladder. And most importantly, you can overturn a system, but we have to help the poor oppressed people really understand their power. And that's, that's what we're working on currently with that. So I wanted to share those two theories with you because they feed into this idea that patriarchy has been another force in allowing women identifying people to develop gestational diabetes. And so that could be something as simple as what does that look like in real life? Well, muted group theory happens all the time when women identifying people go in for their prenatal appointments. Many times, I've, I've cited studies before how many times in the first 18 seconds when the doctor asks you what brings you in today and you start talking, literally, this has been cited in a, a couple of studies that I've actually cited here on the seminar. If you don't say what you need to say in 18 seconds, the doctor will cut you off and say, well, it sounds like you need to do so-and-so. And I told my dad earlier, my ankle has been hurting quite a bit. So I went in on Friday to see about x-rays and some other things because I'm not sure if I fractured and I'm not sure if I sprained it. So we're just trying to do the x-rays to see what the next step is gonna be after we get the results of the x-ray. And I kid you not, he asked me, why did you come in? It I, took me longer than 18 seconds. And he cut me off and said, well, first thing we need to do is x-rays. I hadn't even finished my thought. I had not even finished my thought to tell him why I was there. And so this is why I study health communication because I know that that's a problem. And I think it's fascinating that he's asking me why I came in, but yet not letting me finish my thoughts and let me tell him why I'm there. That's fascinating to me. It blows my mind, okay? So that's a perfect example of that. That is a perfect example of that. So we need to practice what does it mean to not mute 
our sisters, our, our women identifying people when they are telling us what's going on with their bodies, when they're telling us what their problems are, we need to let them speak. And we need to be humble and we need to listen to them and try to figure out how we can support them. And if you identify in that group, I encourage you to continue practicing that because we need to listen to one another and support one another. If you do not identify as a woman, I strongly encourage you to continue practicing that because that means that we're going to need you to use your privilege and your standpoint to help other men identifying or non-binary people understand. And we really need all hands on deck to do this because believe it or not, for any woman identifying who decides that they want to uh, pursue being pregnant and carry someone into this planet so that they can be born, that means they're impacting every single one of us. The person that they are carrying may end up being able to be the, the final person we need to overthrow capitalism. The person that they're carrying might be the final person we need to overthrow patriarchy. The person they're carrying might be the final person we need to reverse and eradicate uh, homophobia and Islamophobia. So we need all hands on deck. We cannot be picky on how many people we have organized with us. Now we need you to be focused and we need you to be ready to stand up and, and overturn these systems of oppression. So if you're not ready, then take some time and process and reflect. But once you get ready and once you're sick of being oppressed, it's just gonna happen like that. And then you'll be ready and you'll come with us and we'll be ready to walk with you. So we need to understand that women identifying people are amazing and helping us get more and more people to join our struggle because we need as many hands on deck to do that, which is why this affects every single one of us. So whether you're a woman identifying yourself, whether you decide that you want to give birth one day, whomever and however you identify, we're asking you to help us, especially for those of us who are women identifying and we want to give birth one day. We need your help because that means we need to be healthy in order to do it. And we shouldn't have to worry about developing PDM just because we're stressed and because someone is not listening to us. That also means that we need to try to encourage one another and have access to resources so that we can figure out what it is we need to do. And I just want to do a quick shout out. This is actually the start of Maternal Health Week, African Maternal Health Week this week and next week. This week, sorry, this week coming up. So April 11th through uh, Saturday the 17th. So again, just how, how many different ways are there that you, especially if you're not women identifying, how can you still support this cause? How can you still raise awareness? How can you still talk about these things with other spaces and other people who don't identify with this, but still celebrate this? Because again, this affects you, whether you know it or not, okay? So I just want us to continue to think about that and continue to remember that African women are not centered in healthcare. That's part of the problem. And so when we think about that, we need to remember healthcare is all about gaining profit and that's not what African women are doing. African women don't, uh, excuse me, protect their ability to gain profit. So because African women get in the way of that, capitalism needs to figure out a way to not value them and to put them as far off on the pedestal as possible because they can't do anything that's gonna threaten the profit not being gained. So we have to keep that in mind and reverse the narrative. And just if you need more examples of what that looks like, what does that look like in terms of standpoint theory and beauty group theory and application and in praxis, just understand that that means we need to try to reverse the narratives that exist, such as birth control methods. So what do I mean by that? Stay with me. I know I'm talking about gestational diabetes and now I'm talking about birth control, but it's actually all linked up because it's all related to patriarchy. So just stay with me for a moment. So with birth control methods, I'm arguing that we need to reverse this narrative. What narrative am I talking about? I'm talking about the narrative that not all birth control methods are being covered with private insurance. But did you all know that medicine for helping men identifying people seek blood flow enhancement pleasure is more likely to be covered in healthcare insurance? So I just want to make sure we understand this. So birth control methods, especially if you have private insurance, are less likely to be covered. Okay, but Medicine for helping men identifying people seek blood flow enhancement. I'm speaking very general because I understand we have different audiences of different age groups that are listening to us, and I want to be respectful and appropriate. But those of you who identify as adults, you know what I'm talking about. Blood flow enhancement pleasures are certainly more likely to be covered by insurance. So what we're saying is it is truly absurd to make a woman identifying person pay out of pocket to control reproduction. Yet men identifying people are rewarded by having access to procreate as they please. That's a, a narrative we need to reverse. That makes no sense to me. <laughs> Maybe I'm missing something. I, I don't know. Maybe I need to go back and re-listen to the narrative. But that makes absolutely no sense to me. None whatsoever. Next slide, please. 
Okay. And so, you know, just keeping in mind with that, when women identify people are 100% healthy, all people are more likely to be healthy. And that speaks to the back backwardness of this system. Men identifying people, we need you to truly reflect on this and to grapple with this uncomfortableness so that you can understand and study in detail why women identifying people need to shake their oppression. And that helps with you being in an organization so that you can be in a position to fight for true reproductive rights. Because as I said before, th those rights affect you as well. And of course, that means rallying with other people of organized identities so that we all can be allies with one another and continue to support one another. And so, of course, if you haven't heard it by now or maybe you missed the boat when we mentioned it before, that means we definitely need to think about joining an organization that works and an organization usually that is driven to smash patriarchy, smash isms of oppression and has a reading list dedicated to learning more about systems of oppression and ways to eradicate them. And I, we all continue to say that we want to join an organization working for justice, but that's really, really important to have this component of political education because you can't understand how you need to go forward if you don't understand what the ancestors have done already because the ancestors have already laid out the framework and the map for you, if you will, the legend, whatever term you want to use to call it. So let's continue to look to our ancestors. Let's continue to look to what they have done. They've already paved the way for us because they had these same struggles when they were growing up and when they were living and they found ways to eradicate them and to make conditions better for people. So let's continue to look to them so that they can guide us. And if we at least look to them and maybe we find, okay, well, this method worked in 1962 or in 1851, but it's not gonna work now in 2021, at least we can understand what our ancestors did because at some point this time is gonna reverse itself. It's gonna repeat itself, excuse me. And we're gonna have to go back to try these things again. So we might as well get educated and understand our history. And doing that, that means we're going to learn more about ourselves. We're going to learn more about our culture. We're going to learn more about our identity that colonization tried to wipe from us. And that means we're going to literally reteach ourselves and unlearn all the nonsense that we learned in white supremacy capitalist education and actually teach ourselves some stuff that's actually going to help make the world a better place. Isn't that ideally what we want? Don't we want conditions to be better? I don't know about you, but I'm not comfortable with the fact that shelterless people live on the street. That burns me up every single time. I see a shelterless person outside holding a sign. That's disgusting to me. Then there's no reason for that, especially when you have all these um, landlords who are buying up all these buildings just to rent these apartments at $1,200, $1,500 a month. That, that doesn't make any sense that you have apartment buildings that are empty, but yet shelterless people are on the street. And in, and in some of these cities and states we live in in extreme weather conditions too. So, you know, we need to figure out a way to fix that. And that means having political education. You cannot do this work if you are not informed on how this work was done before. We have to learn from our um, our sisters and brothers and our non-binary people from the Black Panther Party. We have to learn from SNCC. We have to learn from SDLC. We have to learn from these organizations in Africa. We have to learn from them. They're fighting off colonialization as we speak, fighting it fighting it as we speak. Yes, on April 11th, 2021, they are fighting because colonized groups are trying to come to Africa right now and they're fighting. So let's learn from them and grow. And if nothing else, have an opportunity to read a book so that we can enhance our minds. Isn't that what we want? We want to learn and we want to grow. And I, I, I know I'm not the only one. I know some of y'all understand what I'm saying. So, okay. So yes. Okay. Sorry. Lost my train of thought. Okay. <laughs> All right, so political education, very, very important. And I wanted to highlight this slide because I also want us to understand, you might ask yourself, well, what kind of organization do they want us to join? What kind of organization do they want me to join? We want you to join an organization that is working to fight for justice. But as my dad has said before, maybe you're tired of hearing us talk about it. So maybe you want to start your own, or maybe there's one that exists. For example, I don't know if you all knew this. I have heard about the organization African Girls Run. I say African, but it's called Black Girls. But African Girls Run, and I know that's an organization of African women who jog and run together. What I understand, it's um, not just statewide. It's actually, it's more than just one state in general. I believe it's a nationwide organization. But did you all know that there's also an organization for African bicyclists called African Bicyclists Do Bike? Okay. So African Girls Do Bike, that's another organization that you can join. And then there's one called African Fitness Women. So I just want you to continue to think about, A, what kind of organization are you going to start? 
or B, what kind of organization do you want to follow up with and look them up right now on Facebook or YouTube or Instagram and see how you can get connected with them? I want you to remember that in order for you to fight off gestational diabetes, I think that I need you to try to figure out how to make sure that you are incorporating fitness into your life. And it, it has to be a non-negotiable. So maybe that's working out with your children. Maybe that's doing some yard work. Maybe that's walking around your block in between your meetings that you have for the day. If you're working from your house or whatever that looks like for you, it could be just walking to the mailbox to pick up your mail. If you're like me, your mailbox is not just outside your door. You have to walk quite a ways to go get your mail. And so I purposely park the car and then walk out to do that. You know what I mean? Maybe that means <clears throat> figuring out a way for you to walk to the grocery store if you need just one little quick thing. I'm not saying if you need bags of groceries to walk because then you'd have to carry all of that. but just finding different creative ways for you to get your heart rate going and to make sure that your insulin is doing what you need it to do, okay? And so that also means that making that a non-negotiable, maybe that means setting up uh, a calendar invite so that you can see the notification on your phone. Maybe that means having an accountability partner. Maybe that means you started this organization because all of you like to, all of you like to, I can't even think of an exercise right now. All of you like to do jumping jacks. I bet you all like to do jumping jacks. So you started the African Women Jumping Jacks We Here organization. And so now you're doing jumping jacks and maybe you all are incorporating a 30 minute workout virtually. That way you don't even have to be in the same space and you do it every day for 30 minutes. And maybe you're not able to do it every day together, but you are doing it and then you text the other people in the group thread and say, I just did my 30 minute workout. Just something to keep that heart rate up. And most importantly, to stay connected with other people who are also driven by the same motivations that you're driven by. And so I want us to be reminded that, you know, you might be able to find equipment. So maybe you like working out with items. Maybe you like the barbells. Maybe you want a trampoline. Maybe you really want a yoga mat or a yoga block, whatever your thing is. Maybe you can find those resources through your social media outlet. Put, put a message out there. You never know. Somebody might have some old uh, bands that they're not using anymore and you can use them to stretch. You never know. Just put that out there and just see. Sometimes stuff is on sale. I went to Big Lots and got a trampoline for 40 bucks. Not bad, right? Okay, so just make sure that you're continuing to think about that. And then also use the resources that capitalism has given you. So use the, the parks that have the fitness mater uh, materials and the uh, equipment built in them. If you have access to that park, go to the park and work out for free. Technically, I mean, you're probably using gas to drive there, so it's not free, but you understand what I'm saying. Okay, so we have to smash patriarchy. We also want to smash isms. We want to smash anything that is not allowing poor and oppressed people to be at the front and the center of being organized and mobilized. And so we're remembering to do that and we're remembering to celebrate African Maternal Health Week. If you want to join the conversation, I'm encouraging you all to pick up a book in your organization because you already have a reading list that you all have decided on. And now you're figuring out which books you're reading together and you're discussing them. And you can find books based on fitness and health and use those to read about, use those to help you figure out what it is you're trying to figure out. Maybe you're finding books on GDM because you wanna learn more about gestational diabetes. But whatever it is, make sure that you're using that to fight for justice. And you wanna make sure that you're continuing to think about your ancestors and everything that you do. So insert their names into this conversation to help you share their legacy and also inform someone else so that you can stay driven and stay focused on what it is you're trying to do. Thank you all so much and stay healthy. Thank you, Shakura. And before we, before I close this out, um, just a couple of comments that are coming in. Um, good comrade, Monica talked about how when um, she had her son, she didn't even know that she needed to identify a pediatrician. And if it wasn't for just an individual informing her of that, like she wouldn't even have, you know, been able to know to take that step. I mean, that's, that's astounding. And then, and then it, Good comrade Erica wanted to put a plug out for skating as well as another form of exercise, a good form of exercise. And then good comrade Tiernan had a question for you. Um, Tiernan indicates that they had heard that privileges not having more than others, but not having, or I'm sorry, is not, ha not just having more than others, but not having as many obstacles as other people. And Tiernan wanted to ask if you could just respond with how standpoint theory would respond to that. Oh, thank you for that, Taryn. And I really appreciate that question. I, I think I would argue if I understood 
the creators of Standpoint, and my apologies, I needed to say their name. I could have that in the next seminar because I should know their names. But I would argue, Taryn, and the creators of Standpoint would say, I think your question is asking about privilege, but also the obstacles. I would say they're arguing that with organization, so understanding that they are oppressed and that they need to organize and mobilize with other oppressed people, that's the best way that they can go about not dealing with the fact that they continue to be oppressed because the authors and the creators of Standpoint understand that it is in fact your position. So your standpoint that allows you to have what you need to have in terms of making your conditions better for yourself. And so I, I hope I'm answering your question correctly, but definitely hit me up if it's not making sense. Thank you again, daughter. And, you know, listening to you, listening to Shakura, um, it, several thoughts came to my mind that I wanted to use to close this out today. And that thought is Shakura talked a lot about, you know, how these health issues like gestational diabetes, they aren't just individual conditions that individuals attract. Um, clearly, there's a dichotomy with poor people, oppressed people with these diseases. And so there's a clear connection between socioeconomics and people's health and people's condition. So that's a reflection of this capitalist system and how it's structured. And so Shakur talked about the need for us to, as we always do, organize and be engaged in you know, political education and organizing work to change the system and do that. And I wanted to just point out, like listening to her, you know, break all of those concepts down, that it's important that people realize like, she being able to do that, like that's not an accident. That's not just something that happens, right? When she was born, her mother and I were heavily involved in the African liberation movement as we continue to be today. We raised her up, as I mentioned in the beginning, in this movement, in this organization, we raised her up as a part of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Now, she didn't necessarily understand all of that all along the way, of course not. She didn't necessarily, um, uh, think that all of that was great all the time? Of course not. But we were consistent with that. And we had a standard and a priority. We didn't want to raise her to believe in Santa Claus. We wanted her to believe in justice. We didn't want to raise her to believe in BMWs. We wanted her to believe in righteousness and the fact that all people have value on the earth. We wanted her to be proud of being African, not African-American, not Black, but African, because that's exactly what we are. Um, when the tree, as Malcolm X said, when a cat has kittens in the oven, you don't call them biscuits. So we're not confused about that. We're not even going to get involved in that confusion. You know, how do we become American? We're, we're African. America's been built on our backs. How could we ever be American? So we raised her with those types of principles, you all. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. From day one, these are the principles that she was raised with. And not only did we just, was it just talk, but these were the things that she saw us live our lives under these principles. She all saw us sacrifice. She saw us lose jobs because we stood up for our principles. She saw us have all sorts of challenges and struggles because of our principles. So you could see someone struggle and you might say, oh man, that's not good that they went through that, but you have to respect it when people stand on principles of righteousness and justice, even though you see them suffering and they become stronger and they benefit more in the long run for it. So she was raised viewing that. You know, we didn't raise her to think that, well, look for the easy route, avoid struggle. We raised her to run to struggle and take it head on and fight through it. And so this is, these are the principles that we had. And she saw us do that with each other in terms of how we handled our, our divorce and how we raised her uh, in a principled way towards each other while we were raising her. So that's why, my point, you all, is that's why she can talk like she talks today. And the reason why I can talk the way I talk is because I was raised in the same fashion by people like Romaine, Chip Fitzgerald. Those are the people who raised, I was raised by Black Panthers. I was raised by people in the American Indian movement, in El Partido de la Sunita. These people raised me. They're the reason why I'm who I am today. So that is how we get to where we need to be. Because if you think about it, if more of us are practicing these types of principles, it raises the bar. The reason why the bar is so low today is that most of us aren't doing that. So all we know is what the capitalism gives us. So 
you know, DMX. That's all we know. So that's what we can talk about is DMX dying. You know, even though what he was talking about, I heard his records like you did. So, you know, well, he wasn't talking about nothing that advanced society. He might, he had one or two things that I get it. I understand. I don't need to hear that. But you get my point is that we value people like that more than we value people like uh, Chip uh, Fitzgerald. And the reason why that is, you all, you can't refute it. You can't deny it. The reason why that is, is because we are not consistently and collectively engaging in a process where we prioritize values of justice over nonsense. We aren't doing that. And so the way we get to that point where we begin doing that is we have to get more people involved in practicing those potentials, those, those I'm sorry, those uh, principles. And so when, when we talk about joining an organization in political education, that's exactly what we mean. That's all we mean is doing that. And like Shakur said, you can take a bicycle organization and have a political education study process in that group. And that would be a powerful process if that was what was happening. You can take a cooking club and have it be based in political education and not just have it be about baking cakes, but talking about how the diet of how we consume stuff is how it's adversely and disproportionately impacting African people, impacting indigenous people, impacting Asian people, impacting uh, uh, folks, folks who are poor white people, how, it's, how that's happening and how, how we cook food and who has access to what food they can. You can do all of those things, but you're not gonna do it if you don't have a political education process driving your cooking group or a political education process driving your bicycle group. We're not saying each and every one of you has to be a part of an organization like the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Most of you ain't ready for that and never will be. We fully recognize that. You know, somebody was talking to me the other day. They were like, I want you to help me go to Africa. This person I've known for years, they're as reactionary as they come. And I'm like, I'm not helping you until you engage in a process to improve your thinking. They wanted to go over there because they want to try to figure out a way to do some money making thing. I'm like, I'm not helping you get you stay your ass here. We don't need that in Africa. It, you stay right here where this is the poison is here. Why would I transfer the poison home to Africa? I don't want you. I'm not helping you go home. I'm going to do everything I can to stop you from getting there until you change your thinking. So that's 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 what we're talking about, is that whatever way you do that is a positive thing, you all. And so we just want to close out by telling you to do that. If you want to join uh, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, it's there on the screen, www.aprp-intl.org. If you're African and you're interested, you can do that. A lot of people are doing that from these weekly workshops and other events we do in our party. So we appreciate that. Please allow that to continue. Tell your friends. And if you want to reach out, to us particularly, you can go to www.abetterworld.me, www.abetterworld.me, and you can get more information. All of these video, all of these presentations are uh, recorded. So if you want to look at the video or refer it to someone, you can go there to that www.abetterworld.me, and all the videos are there under the video tab. So you can do that. And we want to also recognize our comrades. Comrade Monica is on here listening. Comrade Onyesamu, they do a wonderful uh, telecast on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. And you see the information there at the bottom of the screen on the left. It's a, it's a wonderful newscast. You should check that out every week like you're checking out this one. And we have one emerging on the East Coast that our APRP comrades are doing. We have one in the Bay Area emerging. So you know, we're trying to combat this beast with revolutionary political education. And there's other organizations, Black Alliance for Peace. Um, Comrade Erica is on here. They're doing that. Uh, a lot of that good work as well. They had an outstanding, they have an outstanding demonstration coming up um, dealing with this foolishness, this backward country is engaging in in Afghanistan. And we want to support that. And we want to do that. So we want to encourage you to do that. And I'm sorry, I'm stopping because White supremacists got the Zoom link and they keep trying to come in and that's not going to happen. So um, trying to just focus on that and talking to you at the same time. So my apologies. But um, if you want to join APRP, that's there. Um, myself and Comrade Erica, uh, Comrade Sister Onyesamu, Comrade Mac, 
Comrade Ghazi. We're editors for the Hood Communist Collective, so you should read Hood Communist, uh, www.hoodcommunist.org. Do that. That's an outstanding site of revolutionary African perspectives. We want to invite you to come back next week. We're going to have a very uh, exciting topic. It's going to be um, white supremacy, patriarchy, and what real solidarity looks like, because there's a lot of confusion about what solidarity means, whether we need it or not, whether it exists or not. So we're just going to debunk all that foolishness next week, Shakur and I. So we want to invite you to join in, same time, same revolutionary Pan-Africanist station, uh, same channels. And then also, you know, the word is out on um, the book that I just wrote and released, A Guide for Organizing Defense Against White Supremacist, Patriarchal and Fascist Violence. We want to encourage you. I'm glad people are buying it. A lot of people are buying it. It's selling like hotcakes. That's wonderful. But um, I did not write the book just for individuals to read it for intellectual knowledge. Um, the book is very inexpensive. It's only a few dollars. So I didn't write it to make money. I wrote the book so that it can get in everyone's hands and you can get with people and discuss the concepts within it and implement those concepts in daily life so we can get organized, you all. So I have a challenge for you. I want to ask you to do that. Talk to someone about the book and see how you can get together with them and study it and implement the concepts in the book and build capacity so that we can all get free. So I wanna encourage you to do that. And you can see how to order the book right there. And I just wanna say one thing, people are still stressing me about someone earlier, you know, I don't do Amazon. I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't like Chevron and Shell too, but you still put gas in your car today. Why did you do that? You didn't go to the gas and say, I'm just not gonna ever drive again because Chevron and Shell are exploitative capitalist countries, companies. Of course they are, of course Amazon is. We are trying to get free. Now I do have one publisher out of Canada that's I'm working with now. I don't know what's gonna happen. You never know um, in this industry, but they said they would look at the book and if they can take it and publish it, then that's what I'll do. I've been wanting to do that, but I, they only was connected to them after this book was published. So sometimes that's how it happens. So, you know, just understand we're, we're poor African revolutionaries trying to get a word out. I don't have a printing press in my next room. I don't have, the ability to ship out thousands of books. I don't know why people keep it. Well, can I just buy it from you? How the hell are you going to buy it from me? Like, I mean, just think about it for a second. You know, how am I going to be able to do that? The only way I can do that is by being strategic. And so right now, that's these beasts called Amazon. And if there's something else better comes along, we'll do that. So please tell people that and tell people to stop with this confusion. You know, do Amazon. Well, yeah, then then don't do Shell, don't do Chevron, don't don't do Safeway, don't don't buy your food at the supermarket, don't do anything related to capitalism. Then, I mean, this selective, uh, this selective uh, enforcement of principles is really interesting to me. Um, and then finally, African Liberation Day is coming up on May 22nd, May 25th. We'll have an international webcast. You do not want to miss this. Our theme this year is Forward Ever to Worldwide Pan-African Unity. And we're going to talk about an action we have related to that in the coming weeks. But we have used up all our time today. We sincerely appreciate all of you for coming. We thank you for staying with us. We ask you to tell people about these events, the New Mexico newscast, um, our comrades doing the podcast out of New York and all the things that are developing. We ask you to buy this book. We ask you to put African Liberation Day on your calendar. But even if you don't do any of those things, we ask you to join or start an organization working for justice. We love each and every one of you. Even if you don't love us, we love you. We appreciate you. We hope to see you back next week. Forward ever, backwards never. One unified socialist Africa, smash patriarchy, smash homophobia, destroy capitalism. One unified socialist Africa. Please enjoy the rest of your Sunday evening.